All right, we are talking LA Rams football on the RLEDS Football Network and on Prime Sports Network's YouTube channel. And uh, joining us for the very first time, Jake Ellen Bogan. Uh, you can catch Jake on YouTube. He's got his own YouTube channel, the Jake Ellen Bogan YouTube channel, as well as Downtown Rams. And Jake also does some writing for turfshowtimes.com. That's an SB Nation website. So, Jake, thanks for doing this. First time we're getting an opportunity to talk to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. All right, Jake. So, want to remind everybody, we did a, a, a really condensed uh, look at the top three draft needs for the Rams. You can check that out. We'll have a link in the description uh, of this video, our Leds Football Network YouTube channel. So, check that out. Uh, we just did that just a few minutes ago, recorded that a few minutes ago, and now we're going to go more in depth here. And Jake, I want to start off with the draft pick situation. Uh, what's, uh, what kind of collateral, uh, what kind of capital uh, does uh, do the Rams have right now? Yeah, so right now they're looking at 11 draft picks. Uh, you know, last year they, they wheeled and uh, dealt uh, to get up to 14. Um, I could <laughs> very well see that again. Uh, I wow. think that's something, you know, they did a... They did the opposite. I remember Sashi Brown uh, back in the day said, we need a lot of picks because it gives us more opportunities to get it right. And I always use that. It's not to throw shade at him necessarily. It's just to show you that there's there's just different mentalities in the league. And Les Snead did not go out and acquire 14 picks just to get one right. He came out with a you know reckless abandon and was like, we want this guy. We want this guy. We want this guy. Yeah. And they, they made moves and, you know, they were able to acquire, I think seven out of the 14 were, you know, key contributors last year. And they're really excited about some of the guys that we didn't really get a chance to see last year. Um, so this year they have 11, they have one at 19, uh, which they've only picked, I believe in the history of the Rams, they've made three selections at 19, maybe two. Um, they are picking at 52, which of course they pick Cam Akers and Tutu Atwell at that pick. Um, they will also be picking at 83 and 99 due to losing Raheem Morris. They got the compensatory pick in 99. They do not have a fourth round pick because they traded that away for Kevin Dotson. Uh, they do have two fifth round picks and they have, I believe three or four sixth round picks. And I okay. think they have a seventh. So yeah, they, they have a lot of, uh, capital here and, you know, the good thing is with the Rams, considering that they view themselves, they're not all in, so to speak, but they view themselves as a contender to win a Super Bowl. Even without Aaron Donald, they believe in this team. They believe in, you know, what they're going to do in this draft. And when you have a quarterback at the level of Matthew Stafford, the way he's yeah. playing, it adds ammunition to decide, hey, look, we have maybe a two, three year window. Yeah. Uh, you know, with Stafford, we can be a little aggressive here. And if we look and say, you know, we feel really confident, maybe we're looking at 2025 as like that pick is going to be in the 30s. We can trade that away, you know? And I think that's, that's a uh, thing to keep in mind here. I think the Rams could very well move some capital from the 2025 draft uh, to move up and acquire a blue chip prospect or maybe even quote unquote buy a pick uh, at the end of the first round this year. Yeah, that's uh, an awful lot of capital and they did less and, and company did such a great job hitting on a lot of those picks last year, which was so important because we all knew what the roster looked like. The depth chart last yeah. year was just amazingly barren and of, of, uh, of prospects. And it was like, wow, how are they going to do this? And then, uh, to, and, and then just sometimes you get, Lucky, sometimes unlucky in the draft, but Les and, and, and company did such a good job. And now they have a ton of more picks. So does Les tend to trade up more, trade down more, or is he just, hey, it all just depends? Les is kind of all over the place. Uh, he doesn't really stay. Like, that's why I like can't okay. see them picking at 19. Okay. You know, whether that's trading up or trading down. And I got to be honest with you, I think they're going to trade up. I think they end up with one of Odunze, Fashionu, or Alt. Um, you know, that's really okay. how like my gut is telling me that. Um, because they don't normally do what they did this offseason, to be honest with you. They I mean, you don't lose Aaron Donald every offseason. But regardless of that, you don't bring in normally if you watch this Rams team and everyone said, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people said they bought, you know, that championship, which is ridiculous. Um 
they don't typically show this much activity in free agency. They normally wait until like the third wave, sign guys that you would never expect, and then they develop them or they turn them into something. Okay. And, you know, Darius Williams early on, Cameron Curl was a surprise for me. I did not even expect them to be interested in him. Going out and getting Jonah Jackson, the funny story about that is Jonah Jackson was the backup plan for Kevin Dotson. They ended up getting Kevin Dotson and they were just like, all right, well, we want Jonah Jackson too. (laughs) And so they basically told at that point, Coleman Shelton, who had opted out, they said, well, good luck. We're not going to bring you back. We're going to move Steve Avila to center. And it goes to show you that the way they drafted last year, keeping in mind versatility as an option with Steve Avila, they had this in mind. Um, It gave them the flexibility to make a move like that. So, there's a lot of different things that they could do. They normally don't sign tight ends. And I thought Colby Parkinson was a great move that's underrated. And he's going to pay dividends early on, especially with Higby injured. But I guess my point in bringing all that up is, you know, that was unprecedented. And so the Rams having the first round pick and actually having it to this point in time, uh, you know, they did have the pick in 2019. Uh, it was the 31st overall, and they traded it away. They ended up taking um, Taylor Rapp, and, of course, the Falcons traded up for, for Caleb McGarry. But I could definitely see them trading up. And I think that 19 spot, it's not bad, but you are right outside of that like splash zone where you're going to get a lot of really, really good prospects. And there's a kind of a little bit of a drop off, I think at 19, especially in your needs, because if you're trying to get, you know, a really good edge defender, they could all be gone by that. pick. Yeah. Offensive line as well. Uh, Even though there should be, I mean, we did our live mock draft (laughs) a couple of days ago and I believe we had a total offensive linemen drafted maybe nine so there's just going to be a ton of offensive linemen including of course tackles taken like you said and then the wide receivers there's so many of them that you do wonder whether or not once you get through that first phase of, of elite guys that there might be a drop off because there's so many of them that you might be oh, i'm going to be a little bit patient here and i'm going to either trade down and get some receivers or i just don't need to take a guy uh it, it, where you are and then you got the other phase with which are the quarterbacks you know i mean who knows yeah. maybe bo nicks Penix. maybe they're available still they should be at 19 is that a spot where somebody wants to jump in and take a quarterback if those guys are going to go that early so yeah i agree uh it's a really interesting spot and you would of course know better and and it's uh, interesting to get your feel there your gut telling you that less uh, might make that move um, because, yeah, last year was about qu- uh, quantity. Maybe this year it is about quality uh, and going out there and getting some difference makers. So we'll see how that pans out. Let's start, first of all, um, on offense. And uh, let's because uh, we talked uh, on the other show about or the other video about uh, top needs. And one of those needs is uh, at wide receiver. And we also mentioned, of course, that the Rams run 11 personnel. Uh, more than any team in the NFL by a wide margin. So getting that third and even fourth impact receiver, very important. Um, and, and from my perspective on the outside, and I don't know, obviously I'm not a Ram fan, but from my perspective, all right, obviously you have Coop. We, we know how good he is. Nakua, what a tremendous rookie season he had. But I personally don't look at the rest of the receiving core as guys that really you would, you would look at if you're an outside team or a fan and go, yeah, I'm worried about those guys. So I would think that the Rams would be interested, especially the fact that you mentioned before their contracts are going to be up as well. So it makes a ton of sense that at some point early in the draft, they're going to zero in maybe one or even two receivers uh, to, to uh, add to the roster. Yeah. um, Especially this type of draft class. When you have a team that's, you know, that loves receivers as much as they do. I I mean, can you imagine them going this entire like crazy? I mean, this is one of the best wide receiver classes I've ever seen. Yeah. And if they were to go this entire draft and not take a receiver, I'd be absolutely stunned. I'd be stunned. Yeah. Because, you know, like I think there are a bunch of guys. The thing about a draft like this, it's really pick your flavor. So, I mean, you have a guy you know, like Brian Thomas Jr., who I brought up in the previous video, who I think is a really good fit. He offers the size factor 
Um, but he had a 72% success rate on go routes. And, you know, I think the Rams showing in the past that they're interested in that level with Sammy Watkins and, and Brandon Cooks and Van Jefferson and Tutu Atwell. Um, I mean, I think the big reason why Tutu Atwell isn't playing is because they saw Demarcus Robinson as kind of a bigger target doing okay. the same thing. So if you could go out and get Brian, uh, you know, Thomas Jr. here, um, and you don't have to, you know, trade up and say he falls in your lap at 19, you know, I think this is somebody who offers kind of everything they look for, willing blocker, um, somebody who can make plays after the catch. Okay. And, you know, I think he would be like that 2 2 Atwell replacement. So, okay. You don't need to put like a ton of, you know, pressure on him early on. Um, I know some people wouldn't like that. Why are you drafting a wide receiver in the first round? Fifth year option for one of the toughest positions to pay, you know? So, <clears throat> I think right away, because of the way that Demarcus Robinson was playing down the stretch last year, the continuity built between him and Stafford, you could have Brian Thomas Jr. be your fourth wide receiver. And until he's ready, then use him when he gets really comfortable in a starting role. Um, but he offers, you know, upside and could be on this roster, you know, obviously past 2024, which now you have three guys signed to the roster past 2024 instead of two. So I like him. Okay. Um, I don't know if they'll go with a, you know, a shorter, quicker, you know, slot guy, but I really like Malik Washington. If they could get him on, you know, day three, somehow, maybe a trade up in the fourth round. Um, you know, they I, look I, for, for also somebody that has return uh, capabilities. So that's the thing. I actually think they would because of the new rules and everything. Um, I definitely think that is going to be somebody that is in play. Um, I think Mal Malik Washington could do it. I think, you know, a guy like Xavier Worthy. I know Les Need's son is at Texas. So does that play any sort of, you know, thing there? Um, <clears throat> you know, I think the big thing here, though, is you have to block to be able to be in this offense. And, you know, some of these guys aren't the best blockers, but Brian Thomas Jr. is one of them. And I'll say this right now. Mention Texas Xavier Worthy, but Adonai Mitchell, um, I think is one of the best route runners in this draft uh, because I, I think he's so fluid. Uh, it's not really as, you know, choppy. Like he's, he's so, he, he's probably one of the most, you know, smooth moving players in this draft. Mitchell is starting to get some buzz yes. uh, where he could go in the first round. I think he definitely goes in the first round. Um, but I, you know, I could see the Rams going after that. You still get the same size factor. He's not as filled out as a guy, you know, like um, Brian Thomas Jr. But I could see somebody like that, um, you know, also being able to do that, that field stretching ability, but also having that route running capability. But I think Brian Thomas Jr. again, I think he's an underrated route runner. I don't think he gets enough credit. And I'll go a step further, and this might surprise you. I like him more than Malik Neighbors, personally. Oh, I, think, okay. I, th I, think, I think Brian Thomas Jr., when it's all said and done, could be like that A.J. Brown and Malik Neighbors has kind of like the DK Metcalf, where, yeah. you know, Metcalf's really, really good. But, uh -huh. <clears throat> you know, when A.J. Brown is, you know, healthy, it, are we really saying Metcalf is better than A.J. Brown? Probably not. Sure. So. Yeah. That's kind of how I see that. Okay. Um, but there's some other guys. You know, I could. I think Ricky Pearsall is somebody that you know they could definitely target. Um, you know, I Javon Baker, and I saw a long you know Twitter thread on him how he could be the closest thing that we've seen to to Puka Nakua, and I thought that was a little crazy at first, and then you know I really looked into it. And I was like. Well, it makes sense in a sense because you're not going to find Puka Nakua in this draft. You're not going to find a fifth rounder that gives you, you know, record breaking capabilities. <laughs> but the thing with Baker was that it was his yards per route run. Um, you know, it was his contested catch rate. And, you know, he's also above six foot tall and 200 pounds and, you know, breaks tackles and, I feel like Baker is kind of of the Rams mold um, because keep in mind, aside from Odell Beckham Jr., the Rams have never gone sexy with the position. 
And that's a thing that people don't really realize. Brandon Cooks wasn't the A+. plus. He wasn't Tyreek Hill. Sure. And Sammy Watkins isn't exactly, you know, going out and getting a Julio Jones, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's the interesting thing about why I could see the Rams, you know, getting a guy like Baker because they don't really normally go after the superstar. Odell Beckham Jr. fell into their lap. And at that point, I mean, he's not really a superstar in his play, more so his name um, and the brand he has. But, you know, I mean, you look, Puka Nakua, not really a superstar, turned into that this past oh, season. Amazing. Cooper Cup, Robert Woods. Like, Robert Woods was just the best blocking wide receiver in the National Football League on a team that predominantly ran the football in Buffalo. And yep. the Rams saw wide receiver, like legitimate wide receiver one capabilities in their scheme were like, bring him on down. 24 yeah. years old, you know? So... That's also the intriguing thing here because I know, you know, there are a lot of Rams fans that are like, oh, I want Devontae Adams or I want, you know, this guy. Oh, yeah. Sexy names. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like you really you look at the pattern and it's not it's not there. No. Um, and they've changed their approach with some players and they've changed their archetypes. Like when you look at offensive line, now they're going after the beefier guys that can be more maulers up front. That was the addition of Jonah Jackson. That was the addition of Steve Avila. Wide receiver, they've kind of maintained what they do. Tutu Atwell was a little bit of kind of a, I, I guess a little bit of a, a you know an outlier in in their normal you know look at wide receivers. But I mean Van Jefferson fit what they do. Van Jefferson was pretty much like a Cooper Cup, you know Robert Woods type. You know I think Tutu Atwell was them trying to find uh, a Tyree Kill to be honest with you. And I think he could do something. I just don't think they, they know how to really get him involved consistently because when Cooper cup was out, um, a lot of people don't realize this van Jefferson was actually the clear out guy. Oh. And Tutu Atwell was really, you know, eating because of that. And then not long after when Cooper cup comes back Tutu Atwell is the clear out guy. And then not too long after that, it's not just the clear out guy who gets ignored they eventually find that Demarcus Robinson's frame was more quarterback friendly, if you will. Okay. And now he's sitting in the soft spot in zones. And, you know, he's also being that clear out guy. But now all three wide receivers, Puka Nakua, Cooper Cup, and Demarcus Robinson are able to eat. And so I think, and this is why, like Malik Washington, as much as I like him, I think they might be done with that type of receiver, at least drafting like high for that receiver, because okay. I, I don't think Atwell is a bust. I don't think Atwell is, is like incapable of playing at this level. I just think that they found something that they like more. And they found that having six foot one, whatever, six foot two, Demarcus Robinson, who's filled out, um, you know, is a bigger target for Matthew Stafford in the middle of the field. And yeah. You know, it's less margin for error. You know, another receiver that is, appears to me to, correct me if I'm wrong, to be maybe a receiver along the lines of what you're talking about could be Lad McConkey. Yeah. I can see that. They went down that road, of course, with their quarterback last year. So um, that that uh, does sound like somebody that fits what you're talking about, that, uh, that Cooper Cup, Puka Nakua type of player that's going to go uh, somewhere uh, in the first couple of days. So, um all right. Roman so, Wilson's another, but he's he's oh, yeah. kind of closer, he's a I guess. Smaller guy. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's the thing. Are they done with smaller guys yeah. like that? I guess we'll find out. <laughs> yeah. But he is he, he's he's an excellent dynamic player, though. Yeah. Um, okay. So tight end, we'll stick with the receivers. So tight end. So uh to bring in Parkinson, uh, we'll find out. I mean, he was really in a I mean, there were, he, he was like a, always in that like three deep room in seattle so he never really got an opportunity to be like a one two what how do the rams see parkinson and what is the latest on higby yeah so the rams see parkinson as a guy that is going to block the heck out of teams uh he okay. just he became such a better blocker because seattle just drafts tight ends and then forgets they have them and they're just like yeah. oh yeah you can just go and block guys uh that's what parkinson did i mean i remember you know scouting i actually interviewed him but I remember scouting him out of, you know, Stanford. And this is somebody that can make just these absolutely incredible contested catch plays. And he just didn't get those opportunities until yep. 
I mean, that Titans game late in the season where he had the pretty much the game winning touchdown. Um, and then they realized, Oh, maybe we yeah. should do that. And then yeah. no, it's too late. Now he's too a free late. agent. Um, with the Rams, they see him as a guy that could be a scene buster. You know, they see him as a guy that can line up in line that can be flexed out. Uh, Tyler Higby is going to start the season on PUP. Okay. Um, unfortunately due to that injury late in the playoffs. Um, so because of that, they also have Hunter long. They also could literally save all the money on Hunter long's contract. If they caught him, there's no dead money. Okay. So I wouldn't rule that out, uh, with money as tight as it's going to be, <clears throat> but they also really like Davis Allen and they have every reason to Allen took significant strides at the end of last year. So I think this is the Parkinson Allen show. If they add a tight end, like, you know, the, the kid out of Penn state or Dalen Holker, um, maybe even, you know, Tanner McLaughlin out of, um, you know, Arizona later on. Okay. I wouldn't be surprised. I'm a big fan of his, by the way. I, I really like him. Um, yeah. But I mean, I also wouldn't be surprised if they don't do anything at tight end and they okay. just do what their usual, <clears throat> you know, they have their guys and then they go out and they get some guys in UDFA who are like, oh, this guy has some athleticism. You know, maybe they could be developed into something. And they've done this before. Um, they got Kendall Blanton, uh, you know, Mizzou um, UDFA, and he ended up being a key contributor in the NFC title game um, when they didn't have Tyler Higby. Um, you know, and he actually started the Super Bowl. He got hurt on the first play and Bryson um, Hopkins had to come in. But, you know, Kendall Blanton is one of those guys that was like a key contributor for them uh, in some moments and even called a touchdown against, uh, you know, the, the Buccaneers um, in that playoff game. So they do value that. Um, they also have some guys, you know, on the roster. Uh, Kalanick is one of them. Um, you know, and then they have the the other guy whose name is totally escaping me. I don't expect them to be anything more than just camp guys, but okay. I guess you never know. Uh, yeah, because also on the flip side, we talked about how much they use uh, 11 personnel and three receivers. They don't use a lot of uh, 12 personnel. And uh, so the whole idea of you know loading up on tight ends doesn't make a lot of sense. So if you're thinking exactly. about Allen and, 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 and Parkinson, well, there's not much more room, especially when Higby comes back, except like you said, especially if they decide to hold on to long. Then it's like okay, they're done. I mean, the only the only reason the only way they probably look, oh, who knows? Maybe what they do is if they find the right guy late in the draft, then maybe they cut long. And yeah. if they don't, then they just hold on to long. They go into camp with those four guys. And he's coming off a devastating, I believe, it was an ACL tear as well. So I mean, oh, he's not. Okay. You know, that's still. It's not like a, an investment where you're like, yeah, I feel really good about this. Like he's yeah. in a contract year. You know, it might make sense to cut bait. He was a throw in in the Jalen Ramsey deal. Um, one thing I I'll say, you know, with this is that what a lot of people don't realize is they have really done a nice job with 11 personnel in the, the motions, uh, you know, that they've used. Um, they feel like, I mean, the way Puka Nakua, Cooper cup and Demarcus Robinson block all, I believe all top 10 blockers, uh, according to PFF, um, in the league, when you have those guys and you can motion them, they can almost act as like a pulling guard and they're going to be able to block as well as a tight end. And that's what allows you to stay in 11 personnel and still run the ball effectively. And okay. so that's what I noticed last year that they were doing. I know they wanted to, you know, use, you know, incorporate more 12 personnel, especially this year, getting some maulers up front. I, I think they're going to take a backup running back in this draft uh, to go with Kyron Williams, maybe somebody like a Braylon Allen, um, to add a little bit of like, you know, a, a, like a, a wrinkle in, in the offense. Um, I, I really think you don't spend the money they spent on a guy like Jonah Jackson and moving Steve Avila to center and bringing back Kevin Dotson if you're not going to run the football. And Good what point. we found is, you know, as great as their passing game can be, Kyron Williams was outstanding last year running the football. Yes. And, you know, the big thing for me that really showed that they had just completely, it was just a far cry from previous years. And they had gone back to, you know, actually I'd even say not gone back. I think they had surpassed the Todd Gurley level Rams in that they were really comfortable in running the ball at any point. I noticed this in the Ravens game. 
when they came out against McDonald's defense, the best run, uh, you know, run stopping defense in the league. Yep. And they pounded the rock eight times on the first drive of the game. <laughs> That's how you knew, yeah. you know? Yeah. So is, is Kyron Williams better than Todd Gurley? No, but do the Rams trust Kyron Williams to run the ball more for whatever reason they did with Todd Gurley? Clearly. Yes. I mean, they, they run the ball more than they did with prime Todd Gurley, who was probably the most dangerous offensive player uh, in the league at that point. So that's where they're at. And I think okay. seeing that Kyron only played what 12 games last year, and obviously he got hurt in the playoff game, I believe broke his hand. Um, I can't see them going into this, you know, this year with Ronnie Rivers and Zach Evans as their running backs. Um, they like Ronnie Rivers a lot. Uh, there's a reason why he's still on the roster and Cam Akers isn't. Yeah, they really like him. Uh, um, he had a very, very successful college career. He was, uh, yeah, uh, but you know, at the size is really the only thing that keeps him away and has kept him away from being more than what he could possibly be and what he was in college. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, they they trade up and get Zach Evans. I think Rams fans put a lot of stock in Zach Evans because okay. you know he's a splashy player when he was you know not riding the pine uh, for, you know, uh, Judkins over there, um, you know, at Ole Miss. But yep. what I'll say is this. I don't put a ton of stock in Zach Evans. He could okay. absolutely prove me wrong, but he is not worth anything in pass, bro. And you have to be able to protect the quarterback. If you're coming in there, you have to be able to protect Matthew Stafford. He's 36 years old. He's had so many injuries. I mean, and the yep. thing is longer than the Declaration of Independence. I mean, it is a long list of injuries. And one of those things is a spinal cord contusion, which that scared the hell out of a lot of people. So much so they thought he was done. Um, if they're willing to put a running back out there, they need to know that yep. this guy can keep the main guy healthy. And I think that that's a big thing right there. So in a sense... I do see them going after another running back, but they have to be able to pass protect. And that is yep. a key component. I also think they want to diversify the running back room a little bit. It's why I've actually pointed to the idea of them going out and maybe signing AJ Dillon. I think he'd be a great compliment uh, to Kyron Williams. I think getting that more bigger, bulkier six, one, 200 plus pound back uh, would really help diversify that room and would give you opportunities where, yeah, Kyron Williams is outstanding, you know, in short yardage situations because he's so just quick to react and, yeah. and he reads blocks well. But at the same time, those are situations where you can get hurt. That's where Kyron Williams broke his hand against the Lions. So maybe you don't bring in a guy like an A.J. Dillon or you draft a guy like Brandon Allen or, you know, somebody like that. I would not be surprised, by the way, because this running back class is kind of being a little... It's just being like dismissed. I yeah. mean, you know, it's not going to be a first round pick. That's why everybody. Exactly. Just, yeah. But yeah. Trey Benson, I wouldn't be surprised that they went after him, especially with that. Uh, because Kyron, it, it, he's not fast. He's quick. Um, he, he doesn't have the, the home run hitting yeah. ability. Yep. And Benson, if he were to come out off the bench after Kyron has been just gashing these teams left and right. And he comes off the bench and just hits a home run. Sure. There you go. Yep. So no, you're right. I mean, that's the thing with running backs too, is that um, if you don't nowadays, if you don't have that superstar guy or that guy that looks like he's just like, can't miss almost NFL's NFL. They're just nah. we'll wait second round, third round. And that's what we're doing this year. But that yeah. doesn't mean that there aren't quality running backs because how many times and look, all you got to do is take a look at Kyron Williams, fifth round draft pick. So yeah, they're Horrible out there. testing. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're out there. So that's probably uh, when they'll wait. Uh, uh, not so early and they don't have to. Okay. So um, up front on the offensive line uh, talked about this being uh, maybe uh, one of the, well, definitely in your, uh, in your opinion, one of the top uh, two or three uh, needs for them at the draft. We talked uh, on the other video about Alaric Jackson, you know, obviously a really nice story solidified himself as a quality uh, NFL left tackle, but um, overall, uh, you believe that uh, they are going to either do one of two things that maybe they trade up to get the right guy, like an alt, or 
um, they decide to pick up a guy maybe in round two. Uh, so either way, though, you believe that they're going to pick someone early. Yeah, I do. Um, if if they don't get somebody like that, then really they're telling us. I mean, I think they're telling us that Alec Jackson's going to get a, an extension. Okay. Um, and he's probably not going to play on the one year four point nine million dollar uh, restricted tender. So that's what that would tell me. Um, maybe not the extension right away. Maybe the extension after the season. If they do draft a tackle in the first three rounds, it really depends on who. I mean, I think, you know, Dominic Pooney out of Kansas is somebody with versatility who could play guard and center. Um, and that's something that they like. I think the thing with Pooney, though, is that he was so dominant at left tackle at KU. And I'm a, I'm a KU fan. Um, so, I, I mean, I watched all of that. But just to see him come from Juco and then just go up against some of these pass rushers and just absolutely, you know, you look at the athleticism, you look at the reactive quickness, you look at the foot speed. Um, he's somebody that I'm really interested in. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned Kieran Amagaji. Um, there are some guys obviously in the first round, they met with Fatanu, um, you know, private meeting after his pro day, they've shown a lot of interest in him. Um, so and they didn't meet with all from what I know. So, I mean, there, there's a chance that maybe they're just, it, it's tough to be in their position because when you know, less need is such a risk taker. The league knows that it's like the Rams can't be seen meeting with Joe. All they can't be seen <laughs> meeting with Romo Dunze. They, like they did meet with Romo Dunze at the, the uh, combine, but yeah, that's a good you point. know, yep. it's one of those things where they kind of have to keep it under wraps and, you know, they really have, um, you know, I've, I've interviewed prospects the Rams have drafted where at the time of interviewing them late in the process, they had not spoken with the Rams yet. And that changed like right before the draft. So they do things like that. Um, but I think with tackle, I mean, there's so many options. Sua Matea is, is somebody um, that again, you know, I think fits that he's not as good in my opinion as Kieran Amagaji, but um, they're similar in that they have a lot of athletic upside. They can be molded into what you want. They can be your left tackles um, and they don't have to start right away. So you don't have the pressure of having Alec Jackson bringing back Joe Nopum and being like, well, we're spending all this money on these guys about 14, 15 mil million total this year. And now I have to start Joe Walt over all of them. But I okay. honestly think that's, that would be an okay thing. I think they would do it if it was, if it was worth it. Cause I mean, this year, whether they like it or not, because no boom, he took a lesser contract, but he still is, has a cap hit of 10 million. Yeah, so he wow. saved money because it was 20 million, right? He took a pay cut to come back to the Rams uh, and it saved him money. But make no mistake about it. Joe Noteboom is going to make more than whoever is starting at left tackle this year. That's crazy. Yeah, it is. But you know what? You need it. <clears throat> Every, and especially if you have a <laughs> quarterback like Stafford back there, you're not yeah. going to win unless you protect them, which is another reason why uh, the strategy of moving to running the football more makes a lot of sense uh, to make sure that it's not all uh, defense is just unloading on Matthew Stafford. Uh, so what about the two guys that they drafted the last couple of classes? I know Bruss had the injury. Uh, yeah. McClendon uh, was picked up last year. Um, didn't play a whole lot. Uh, so uh, how do those guys fit in long term? So McClendon looks to me like he's either going to be a guard, um, you know, spot starter, or they really want to develop him into the successor for Rob Havenstein. And honestly, in a perfect world, that's where he is. That's a great okay. fit for him. Um, could play left tackle in a pinch, but I don't think he's a left tackle at the NFL level. Um, Bruss is somebody who I am not out on. Um, I know a lot of people are done with him. Third round wow. pick. <laughs> they take a tackle. They move him to guard. Um, I mean, he tore his ACL and MCL, I believe. Like, I, I remember I was at I was at a movie and I came out and I see that our third round pick, our top pick in that draft, uh, tore his ACL and MCL in preseason. I was so upset. But um, Bruss, for me, is somebody that they kind of realized, hey, we were trying to move him to tackle, uh, move him from tackle to guard. It didn't work out. He showed more promise to tackle. He missed his whole rookie season. The rookie season in which he could have been taking time to get better, yep. he now has to focus on his like medical. So he has yep. to focus on rehab. So the following season, he doesn't make the team. 
he does get brought back on the practice squad and he was signed to a futures deal. Um, again, how much do you trust this offensive line coaching? I trust it a lot. So this is somebody that I think could emerge, um, you know, as another option to, you know, replace Rob Havenstein. Okay. Um, you know, he could also be another spot starter. He's not going to be a left tackle. I can tell you that. Okay. So with those things considered, and I know they like Mike McAllister a bit uh, as, you know, potential backup center. Um, <clears throat> you know, they brought him back. And the, Zach Thomas actually had, I mean, it wasn't great, but he had opportunities at left tackle this year against, uh, you know, the Bengals. I look at this, our Curry being a seventh round center, uh, se uh, seventh round left tackle. Um, I don't know if he's necessarily going to have much of a role there. I think he's just kind of a backup guy. Okay. So I think really the pathway there, you could draft like another interior offensive lineman for sure. Um, I think getting a backup center for Steve Avila probably is the move. I think uh, somebody that would be an upgrade over Mike McAllister. Um, I could also see them going, you know, with three guys. I could see them going with a tackle, a guard, and a center. I like Cooper Beebe as well for them. <clears throat> I like the fit there. But I definitely think the pathway is 100% there on the depth chart to go out and get a left tackle in the future. All right. Let's... Slide on down on the rlads.com depth chart for the Rams, and we will have a link in the description of this video so you can check that out, as well as links in the description of the videos where you can check out uh, all of Jake's uh, content, both at turfshowtimes.com and YouTube. So let's take a look on defense. Uh, we'll start, first of all, with the position that you believe uh, is the most important, and that is the edge rush department, which – this could be a position and we both agree because I actually, when I was writing down what I thought the needs were, I put edge times two, uh, <laughs> which you did talk about uh, as the number one need and possibly adding some as well. So here's a situation again, like we were talking about with trading up possibly for all that maybe if they trade up, like if it's announced that the Rams make a trade, they've traded up. Basically what you're going to be waiting for is, okay, is it alt or verse? Who <laughs> are they taking? Uh, and if they, if that scenario were to, were to come true, what, give me a percentage, what do you lean more towards? Do you think if they trade up, they're going to, and I know a lot may depend on where, but let's just say it's, uh, around eight, nine or 10. Uh, cause I think that could be where all slides to and verse that's pretty much where people have him going. So let's say it's around that, that spot. Uh, what does your gut tell you that it's verse or alt? So I actually, I don't think it'd be verse. Um, I think it'd be all fashion new or if Roma Dunes AFL, I think those would be the three guys for sure. Um, the, you know, just because I think like, again, I think w we might be ahead of the curve here on the left tackle. Like I think a lot of, like not all the fans are coming to realize like they could draft the left tackle. Um, I think I kind of see like the, the future in a sense, like That's where okay. some people are like, Hey, you know, Alec Jackson, they have him. He's good enough. And it's like the Rams don't operate with good enough though. They, they want to make sure they have the guys that they want to have. Um, so I could see that verse is interesting verse played, you know, college 30 minutes from me uh, at U Albany before transferring to Florida state. So um, that was really cool. Um, I didn't actually know that. <laughs> <laughs> I found that out later on. Okay. Well. Uh, but but verse is he he's not as explosive as I think they might be looking for. Hmm. Um, like again, I think chop would would make a lot of sense in that regard. Um, but he's somebody I I really do like. I have a lot to a tick ahead of him. Okay. I have chop as my number one edge defender. Um, okay. so I'm not. What really... about if they stay at nineteen? Who do you think, which edge rusher do you think fits at 19? I think Latu has the the largest chance to fall because of the medical. I yep. kind of have a feeling, I mean, Chop might be there, but I feel like Chop is going to be way liked more by the NFL than mock drafts, if that makes sense. Sure. Because um, I mean, like PFF has him at what, 44? I don't think he's going in the second round. I, I just, no, I, I I, 
Yeah. You can't look at a guy with those those traits. And by the way, I think he's the only one that possesses elite traits at edge. Like I think Latu has a lot of what you like and has a you know a high. In my opinion, I think he has a high floor, but I think his ceiling is somewhat limited. I think Verse is kind of in the middle there, and I think Chop has a like elite level ceiling and a higher floor than giving credit for. Um, but yeah, I think if anybody were to fall to 19, I kind of feel like Dallas Turner is going to go because people look at yep. Dallas Turner with oh, the athleticism. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm not as high on Dallas Turner. I don't think he's bad. Neither am I. I, I don't think he's, he's definitely not Anderson. And no. I just look at him as a good, solid football player. I do not look at him as a difference maker. No, I, th I think he's more like at this point, I think people look at him more as an athlete than, than an edge defender. I think they look at him more as a rusher. And I think th the reason why I say edge defender all the time is because I want to kind of, you know, reinforce the whole point of the position. It's not yeah. just rushing the passer. It's also setting the edge, playing the run. And that's something that I, I value. And, and I think they all do it better than giving credit for it. Just like, like I see a lot of, complaints about verse you know setting the edge and chop and I, I don't see anything on dallas turner and ironically that's the one guy when i was watching the film i'm like this guy ha offers nothing in the run game in my opinion so um you know i think he's gonna go early like you okay. know what i mean i think he could go in the yeah, top 10 because of his athleticism which is kind of funny because i think chop is a better athlete but you know, I think he'll go in the top 10. I think the verse will probably go in that top 15 range. And then I think at 19, um, you know, if Latu doesn't get picked by the Seahawks, I could see him going to the Rams. I could also see the Jaguars picking him for, you know, just that, that insurance in case, you know, a guy like Josh Allen just pushes his way out the door. Um, and I could also see chop for the same thing. After that though, those are the only guys I can really see. I mean, that's the problem with this edge class is that it's very top heavy. I think yeah. there are some guys that you like, you know, Jonah Ellis and, you know, his, his work ethic and just the motor stands out, um, you know, Braswell and, and Isaac are solid. Um, but it's, it's weird for me. This draft is like, if the Rams don't get one of those top edge defenders, they're probably going to hold out and get a guy like Mo Kamara, um, who I think would be a, in a really nice rotation. Um, you know, get a guy like uh, Solomon, I believe, from Troy. Um, you know, those those kind of like high motor, high energy guys. And then if they do that, <clears throat> that's telling us that they really feel like, hey, we invested three picks in edge last year. You guys need to cool it with edge being a, <laughs> uh, you know, a big weakness of ours. We believe that, you know, it's really good. I just can't sit here and say in good conscience that that's what they're going to do because knowing that they made, they had that much interest in Van Ginkle. I, I just, I don't think that's the case. And honestly, okay. if they had that much interest in Van Ginkle, I guess look out for, for Jalex hunt. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and, and that's uh, someone that you might see in round two, correct? I can see him round two, round three. Um, okay. I know that, you know, some inside info last year, they were really interested in, in uh, Mapu um, and uh, the Patriots traded up and took him right in front of them. They weren't very happy about that. So they had okay. to pivot. Uh, I don't know if he would have been a pick instead of Byron Young. Byron Young felt like a best player available pick. That's also something to keep in mind when looking into this. It doesn't seem like like Kobe Turner is a guy that they had highlighted as somebody they loved. That was Les Snead's favorite pick. Because Byron Turner was a uh, Byron, Byron Young was a best player available. It okay. doesn't necessarily mean that they were in love with him like they were with Kobe Turner. And now they really like him. I have no doubt, and I really like him. But being that he's 26 in you know season two, I, I could see them getting another guy early on for that reason alone. Okay, and then what about sticking with the defensive line? Big hole. No more Aaron Donald. Uh, take a look at Bobby Brown. He seemed to have his best year last year. Uh, yeah, so he was that's great. Nice. Uh huh. 
and then all but that's it you look at the rest and besides of course uh turner but you look at the the rest of the group and um there's just not a lot of experience there so uh this is another position that you think that they're definitely consider uh at, at some point but how early yeah i mean I see a lot of Byron, uh, you, you know, I'm totally blanking on his name right now, um, out of Texas. <laughs> um, Murphy? You know, yeah, Byron Murphy. Thank you. Byron Murphy the second. I don't know how I blanked on a guy's name I see every day. But, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Byron Murphy the second out of Texas. I see a lot of his name, and I think it's because Byron Murphy kind of had like a social media post after AD retired, like, I'm next. And so, okay. like, I think the fans just kind of got excited. I don't see the position. I don't see the positional value for the Rams there. Really? I mean, yeah. you had a guy who, in my opinion, should have won defensive rookie of the year, but I'm biased uh, in uh, Kobe Turner. Um, and you got him in the third round. You got him at the end of the third round. Doing that, spending the pick that you spent on Bobby Brown, and he's so good in the run game and doesn't get enough credit in the, you know, passing game because he really wasn't utilized in that way last year. Normally when it was, you know, the passing downs, he came out and Kobe Turner came in um, right. and they had him in on, on, you know, rundowns because he's so good against double teams. Then you have Deswan Johnson who really, I thought started to emerge at the end of the year and was gaining a lot of, you know, um, confidence. This is somebody I actually predicted to go to the Rams. I thought he fit, the mold of what they would look for. And they ended up making him Mr. Irrelevant. Then you have Corey Durden who I forget how they acquired him. Um, but he's somebody who played a game and they liked him so much that they're like, we're putting him on the practice squad. We're not going to use an elevation for him and we're going to hold on him next year. Okay. Um, so that's interesting. They brought back a uh, Laryl Murchison who I like, but he's again, rotational piece there. So they need to add another guy. And yeah. my thought process is, I don't know where he's going to go because I think he's honestly one of the best interior defense linemen in this draft. That's Makai Wingo from LSU. He's got that get off. And, and like, I'm not saying he's Aaron Donald because no one's Aaron Donald. That, let, let's be clear here. But he's got that get off where people are salivating over Byron Murphy Makai Wingo is kind of like Byron Murphy in that he's got that get off, but I think he's better at it. Um, and, and I think he's somebody who you don't have to spend a first round pick on could go in the third round. I mean, you know, I've seen mock drafts having him in the fifth. I don't see that, um, but I could see him going at 99 or they trade down into the fourth or trade up into the fourth okay. and they get him. And he's somebody that I think would start ahead of Deswan Johnson. And now you have, I think, a decent group of guys there. Um, you know, I he's really, really fun. When I when I turn on the tape with him, I know everyone's talking about his teammate Mason Smith, I believe his name. Um, I think he's better. And I think Makai Wingo has the explosive grades. He has the same explosive grade that Aaron Donald had. And I I, I see it on tape. That's impressive. All right. Well, let's talk about some of these other players up front. Um, we talked about some of the edge rushers, but uh, you, you take a look here and because I know we talked about this on the other video. So mm -hmm. uh, Hoyt, very underrated season, third in yeah. tackles, added six sacks. It's pretty good uh, for a former college free agent. Um, and then you throw in some of these other guys that really, if you're not in LA, you don't know who they are, uh, unless you're, you know, a big draft guy, but I mean, Hampton had a very good college career at app state. So he yeah. didn't play much last year. Uh, you got, um, uh, Oshan, uh, Mathis, who also didn't play a whole lot last year as a sixth round draft pick. And, um, Let's start there. We'll start before we move on the inside of the linebacker. Start with some of those guys because, again, even though we know they're going to need to add the edge rushers, those are players to keep an eye on down the road. Yeah, it, it's it's really fascinating um, because O'Shawn Mathis is somebody that I just thought was a draft and stash. And then he actually, <clears throat> I, had, I had mentioned this in the previous video, but he had gotten off to such a good start that he was at one point like playing over Byron Young. Um, oh. And he got hurt early on in camp 
And it threw him off. Like he ended up having to be one of the guys where, you know, they added him to the IR after they kept him on the roster for a day. Okay. I hate that. I kind of hate that rule, but um, they had to add him to the IR after. Uh, and so he came back. And I think his first game was the week five against Philly. And he wasn't amazing, but you could see the the raw athleticism there. You could see him getting through. He had a couple pressures in that game that kind of were like, okay. And he's big. He's big. He's tall, you know, long. I mean, he definitely, he was an interesting one there. Um, so that's just his rookie year. And it yep. got off to a horrible start in a sense that he gets hurt. Um, most importantly, didn't really get a chance to play in preseason. Okay. So now he gets a preseason and you start to wonder, you're like, hmm, what do they have in this guy? Nick Hampton uh, down the stretch actually started playing more uh, because there, were, there was a time where O'Shawn was the guy and Nick Hampton was a healthy scratch. And then Nick Hampton actually surpassed O'Shawn at the end of the year. And he had a huge pass breakup in that 49er game uh, where they were sitting most of their starters. So Nick Hampton's interesting because he's got some off ball linebacker, uh, you know, experience. And, you know, I think he's a guy that like they might actually, I don't know if they'll do this, but I wouldn't be surprised if they moved him to inside backer. I wouldn't be surprised, but at the same time, his tools as a pass rusher, albeit not at all refined, he's got stuff there. So that's kind of, you know, I don't go right ahead and say, yeah, that, you know, who cares about these, you know, edge defenders, no one cares, whatever. Like, I think that there's something to be said. I mean, you can't on one hand be like, Oh yeah. You know, Puka Nakua is why you can't give up on a fifth rounder and then be like, Oh, Nick Hampton was a fifth rounder. He's nothing like, all right, well, you know, pick a lane and stick in it. Right. And so go ahead and doubt less need all you want. Exactly. The facts are just there. And you've had what 13 years or 12 years plus of, uh, of course, not every year was great, but for the most part, he's shown you that, I mean, and he should, he deserves to be respected. And as a fan of the Rams, I would hope that most Rams fans would just be like, well, you know what? If Les likes him, that's okay with me. I think a lot of people have gotten to that point. Um, there's still times, like, I understand. I think the one knock on Les is like his draft day trades. He does a lot of those pick swaps, and people uh-huh. are like, trust me, I, I want to rip my hair out when I see that because it's one of those things where you're like, oh, this is such a great trade. And then the rest of the trade comes through, and you're like, but why are we giving up two picks? Like, sure. what, what, what's the deal? Yeah. Um, so he does those, and I'm like, okay. But also, I feel like those are kind of handshake deals. I mean, we've seen Could that. Be. They yep. traded away, uh, you know, Kenny Young, who was a starting linebacker on the Super Bowl team early on. And people were like, why did they do that? And they trade him to Denver. And then all of a sudden, fast forward, I don't know, six, seven weeks later, Von Miller's Ram. And you're like, how'd they do that? You yeah. Know? So, you know, it's it's just something, you know, yep. uh, reading the tea leaves. But, right. but no, I, I do think that, that is really, I'm going to be consistent in saying that if you're one of those people out there, uh, change your ways because yes. Puka Nakua was a fifth round pick. And I didn't uh, believe in him. I was like, wait a second. Come on. I mean, this guy, <laughs> and he's having a hard enough time producing at BYU for crying out loud, but that just shows you, I mean, Kyron Williams, I, the same thing. I was not a big fan of Kyron Williams. I was like, come on. He didn't even do much at Notre Dame. So how's he going to do anything? That's just, that's what scouting is all about. And it's not just a player, it's about the player and the fit. The fact that they know what certain players fit with their team. And that's why you have to have a great connection with your coaching staff. So you know what they want and need for those specific players that you have to go get for them. And they obviously have have great communication between uh, McVay and Snead. Yeah. It, well, exactly. And, you know, like Puka is somebody that I, he, I thought he really stood out. His, his body control near the sidelines really stood out to me when I was watching tape of Jaron Hall. Um, so he was somebody that I liked, but I never finished his evaluation. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one of those swing and a miss. Uh, oh, moments. Yeah. But sure. But I, I liked him. You know what I mean? I, I wasn't saying that I'm like, oh, he's going to be the best receiver uh, that we've, we've seen for a rookie, but 
I, I liked him. Uh, Kyron was my number three running back. So when he fell to the fifth round, I was actually surprised. Yeah. And then when they traded up, I was even more surprised. Loved it. Um, and, you know, I, I pounded the stump for him because I thought he was better than Akers because Akers couldn't block. Um, but I think there's just so many examples. Yes. Like, if you're looking at a less need Rams team and you're saying, well... They need to do this because that fifth rounder, Nick Hampton, is just a fifth rounder. And they just spent a sixth rounder on Oshan. Let me remind you, Jordan Fuller, who they wanted back. Uh, they opted again. You know, it just didn't end up working out. But they wanted back, was a captain for them. Four-year starter out of Ohio State. Sixth round. And, uh, you know, I think there's a guy that they're going to, out of Ohio State, six foot two, 200 pounds safety. Josh Proctor, like look for them to draft him in the sixth, seventh round. I think he could do the same thing, but okay. it's the whole point is this mentality. It goes back to what we were talking about with the whole Sashi Brown comment. You're, you're, you know, you want 13, 14 picks. So you get one, yes, right? That's it. Les Snead wants 13, 14 picks. So we can get them all right. And he can have 13, <laughs> 14 players. We're not the same. And yeah. so, you know, that's the important thing to realize. And I think, you know, some people have done a really nice job in, in, you know, alluding to that idea like, hey, you don't go out and spend 14, you know, picks on these guys for nothing. And so, you know, there, I would not be surprised at all, to be honest with you, if a guy like Nick Hampton or a guy like O'Shawn Mathis ended up emerging in a way where okay. whoever they draft, they can't even get by them yeah, this year. They gotta, they gotta battle them for competition. You know, yep. I, I wouldn't be surprised by that. And and I'm sure they're kind of looking at that like, hey, you know, Jason Taylor the second, that's why we're not drafting a safety. They could draft a safety, right? I mean, seventh rounder Russ Yeast the year before was starting this year for them. So you could just never really assume. I mean, Darion Kendrick, a sixth round uh corner, was starting that rookie year at corner. Uh yep. Quentin Lake. You know, at the the recent owners meetings, all the interviews with Sean McVay and he was mentioning these key contributors that are going to be, you know, core players. He mentioned Quentin Lake multiple times. Okay. Lake is somebody who I really liked in the draft, uh, kind of that hybrid linebacker safety guy uh, with some good range and athleticism. He's playing their star position last year and doing such a good job as a sixth rounder that they view him. He's kind of like their Kyle Hamilton, you know, and I think that's, that's wow. huge. You know, they really, really like him. And then when they went out and got Cameron Curl, I'm like, wait a minute, Cameron Curl can kind of do the same thing. Are they going to be interchangeable? Cause that's scary. If you, you have those two guys. So that's, that's really want. just, you know, an idea of like, Hey, don't, don't write them off. Ernest Jones, third round linebacker wasn't a first round linebacker, right? They still want to bring him back on a long-term deal. So ne it never count him out. It's the same thing that goes for what we were talking about with Deswan Johnson, Mr. Irrelevant. Yeah. Don't count him out just because he was the seventh round pick. Yeah, if anything, uh, especially with again with the less need team, and you look at their depth chart and you see those guys, and 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 especially if they're late round picks uh, or even mid to late rounders, you should put that in your head as all right. Well, that that's that's not a total need, uh, but it's something that uh, like we talked about that'll add competition. And it also opens things up and it makes it a lot harder to predict exactly what the Rams are going to do. And that's great. That's, that's what I'm sure the Rams love is that yeah. you just never know what they're going to do because they do have pretty much every position sprinkled with these types of players. And uh, you just don't know exactly how confident they are about these players. So with our last uh, five or 10 minutes, let me ask you, cause you named some of them already and they did add in veterans, Williams, Curl and white. Um, it is interesting. You mentioned, I, I believe in the other video that white, who I think at this stage, he is, he got it to such a great start to his NFL career that I think the rest of his career has been, he's been living off of it because he hasn't really, he's got injuries. He hasn't really been that guy for a few years. And yet, as you mentioned, Witherspoon had such a solid year last year that the, the Rams decided to kind of go one direction to the other. So they do have white Williams and curl now to that secondary. And then you throw in all the other no names. So yeah. then, so, so what we have to figure out here is what we need for you to explain to us then is, uh, out of those free agents and out of those later round guys, what what do you think the Rams then need the most of in that secondary in the next year or two to 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 solidify it? Yeah, so 
I mean, I could see them drafting a corner and a safety in this draft, but I think because they went out and got Tredavious white, because I mean, there was no uh, Witherspoon or white. I mean, there was just nothing there. You know, they went out and got Darius Williams and everyone's like, okay, so they're going to get Nate Wiggins who by the way is not a schematic fit, but um, you know, he was getting mocked to the Rams at, at 19 and then they go out and get Tredavious white. And let's just be very clear here. Kobe Durant looked like an absolute budding superstar in his rookie year. And then they move him to star, which by the way, Quentin Lake took over at the end of the year. They move him to the star position and he starts to struggle. Okay. And he's not as, so it, it makes you wonder, like, I mean, if he's playing just regular cornerback, maybe he goes back to where he was. So they really like him. They really like Darion Kendrick. Now Kendrick has to, you know, cut down the penalties because uh, he had 11 last year. Um, that's not going to do you any good. Plus when you get that, you know, you get that reputation. Now you're going to get called even times where you shouldn't get a penalty. Um, so they really like him. They really like Trey Tomlinson uh, as well. They like Cam McCutcheon, probably not going to make the roster, probably be another practice squad guy, but he's going to have a great preseason. He had one last year. Okay. So looking at corner, I expect a, a, like if they trade in the fifth in some capacity, I could see them going after a corner there. Um, I expect a fifth round pick. Um, you know, I think they're going to go after, you know, a guy like uh, a Dwight McLaughlin. I, I think he's just like a perfect fit for them. Okay. He's also one of my favorite corners in this draft. All right. Um, if they go a little higher, I would go Max Melton. Um, just very traitsy, really athletic, long. Um, because Tredavious White's only signed a one year deal. And keep this in mind, Darius Williams, you know, while it's a three year deal, it's incredibly team friendly and okay. that they could cut him after this season and okay. really only get about 2 million in dead money out of it. So um, that's something to keep in mind there. But I think and you mentioned Max are, Melton, by the way, uh, of course there is a connection already from last year's uh, well, from uh, well, from what they did um, by uh, putting his former teammate uh, Fado Kasi on the team. Cause yeah. I'm a Rutgers guy. I'm from New Jersey and Fado Kasi was a beast for Rutgers defense, a beast. And yes, maybe he doesn't have the, 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 uh, what you're looking for overall, uh, at the position, but, uh, he's going to be a player and it'll be interesting. Maybe he's one of those players we just talked about. One of those players, yeah. that college free agent doesn't get drafted, but, uh, keep an eye on him. So yeah, Melton very fast. We know that, uh, he was going to have a big year this year, and then he had an injury to start the season. And it wasn't until late in the season that w when he started getting healthy that he started looking like his old self. So because of that, it's possible that he might be uh, kind of overlooked, uh, even though the the 40 time kind of got everybody back on him, uh, which might not work out well for anybody that was interested in him. But yeah, very talented player to keep an eye on, Max Melton. Yeah, I wasn't exactly happy about the 40 time because I liked him as kind of a later <laughs> round option. And and now that's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think, you, you know, you look at a guy like, you know, him, Jarvis Brownlee uh, out of Louisville, who they met with, um, you know, so he's somebody that I'm looking at. Kalen right. Carson from Wake Forest, um, Kamal Haddon from Tennessee, Cam Hart from Notre Dame. Um, those are just some guys that I had, you know, already listed here that okay. I'd be interested in. I think but later you, on in the draft, later on though, is that what you're thinking though? Is that this is not a position you see them using one of the early picks on? Yeah, because kind of similar to edge, although it's like way more of a need, I think at edge, um, cause you don't have a big name like Tredavis White or Darius Williams. Um, you know, I, I think they really feel like they invested a lot of capital in the cornerback position. I mean, yes. they drafted Trey last year and again, they look at sixth rounders like uh, like actual investment yeah. on like other teams. Yes. So when you factor that in, you know Trey Tomlinson in the sixth round, who by the way was covering Devontae Adams and doing a nice job in those joint practices during the you know off season. Um, you know it's worth mentioning that okay. they you know he didn't get a chance this year, but that was all circumstance. I mean they added Akella Witherspoon after the draft, you know, and he wasn't even an option. I mean the Steelers yeah. just cut him. You know, he wasn't a free agent. You know, the Steelers just ended up making him one. So G give me the something... order. Give me the order of the talent of these players that you think uh, have the highest upside out of all of us young kids in the secondary. The highest upside to me is still Kobe Durant. Um, okay. I think he's the quickest that people write off. Then I think Trey Tomlinson has the, the second highest. Then Darion wow. Kendrick. Really? Trey yes. Tomlinson. Okay. 
Cause, well, yeah, because I think, you know, he won the Jim Thorpe Award. Um, he's somebody that I think a lot of people discredit because they're like, oh, he's just a slot corner, which, by the way, Kenny Moore still showing you, you can get paid playing slot corner in yes. the NFL. Yes. Um, regardless, though, if he is or isn't, why is he on the outside locking down Devontae Adams? You know? Who do you think right now, if you were controlling the Arles depth chart, Mm-hmm. Uh, who do you think should be and will be the starting nickelback? Will it be Lake? Um, so I mean, really at, at star, I mean it's gonna be Lake unless they do something different. And that's that's also the possibility here because since they lost Aaron Donald, they're gonna have to get creative. They're not gonna be able to do the same things that they did. Aaron Donald yeah. gave them opportunities to run their their you know scheme a little bit different, right? So they might be a little bit more aggressive and I could see Lake and Cameron curl um, kind of being interchangeable at star. Okay. Um, and then maybe you have, you know, Kobe in the slot. Um, I mean, he was better on the outside. Maybe you even have Tredavious white in the slot or you have Darius Williams in the slot. I mean, I guess it really depends. I could see them having kind of an interchangeable secondary. That's good to have. Yeah. Yeah. Like That's I think, I think that's one thing they like disguising coverages as it is. But if you have okay. these guys moving every which way and you feel confident in them doing it. Okay. I think it add another element to your defense. All right. We only have two minutes left. So let's quickly, the free safety spot, are they set? Or do you think that's a position that more than likely they'll want to upgrade? I think they, I don't know if they'll upgrade. If Tyler Newbin is the best player available, I could see them going after that based on their newfound love for safety <laughs> going out and getting Cameron curl. Um, but look out for Malik Mustafa. Um, so fun fact with him, I interviewed him and he okay. actually told me his mom is the reason he transferred from Richmond to wake Forest. He's also the reason she's also the reason that he transferred and Kobe Turner transferred to Wake Forest. They're best friends. So there is a connection there. Um, Mustafa, I believe, met with the Rams back when I, I spoke with him. And he's got that range. He's got that hard-hitting ability that they had with Nick Scott. Um, I could easily see him fitting in in the back end of their secondary. You get him in the fifth round. Okay. They have back-to-back fifth-round picks. I could see that being McLaughlin and Mustafa there okay. um, and would really bolster their their defense. Because, again, it goes back to what we're saying. They yeah. look at these picks. A little, these these yeah. lower picks are still picks. They're and, not and just either, throwaways. Either way, you're looking secondary, mid-to-late-round picks. Mm-hmm. And um, last thing, because we kind of brushed over it uh, just quickly, Christian Roseboom, I mentioned Fado Kasi. Uh, do they want to upgrade that inside linebacker room? I don't think that they would pick a high pick on, on one of them. I mean, I think if Peyton Wilson fell in their lap at 52, I think they'd oh, budge. Love him. Um, because of the medical, he could. He, I mean, yeah. it's, it's possible. Yeah. But I think with them, I think they would probably go with a guy like Jalen Ford out of Texas um, that could offer some capabilities, you know, maybe in the fifth round, maybe okay. in the sixth, depending on where he falls, but could offer some capabilities in special teams, um, which is, by the way, Fadu Kasi is a really good special teams contributor. Yes. So he's probably going to make this roster. And for a lot of people at home that don't know who he is, um, <laughs> this is a team that you go back and you watch when they had Corey Littleton, they give these guys an opportunity to, to make the team. So wouldn't rule him out either. Absolutely. Again, like I, I, they just used to, he was like the big O at Rutgers. That's how <laughs> he had his own letter. So he was a, a, a big time player there and uh, they loved everything about him. And I'm glad to see that he's caught on and I'm sure he's at the right team. That's for sure. All right. So uh, I appreciate everything that you've been able to provide us here today, Jake, an Absolutely. awful lot of information, which I love <laughs> the more. Inf- and I could have, I could have just sat back and you could have probably, we could have done this for another half hour. Uh, um, easily. I, yeah. I could go five hours. I mean, I, I'll yeah. talk, I'll talk the Rams right off the top of my head on demand. I, I'm, I'm on top of it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we look forward to having you back because of that. Uh, definitely after the draft, we'll, uh, we'll have an opportunity to go over everything. And uh, yeah. And like I said, description links in uh, the links are going to be in the description. You can check that all out for everything that you cover. And uh, we look forward to talking to you following the draft. Best of luck. Thank you As so a fan. much. I <laughs> appreciate it. I know it. you're not drafting. So best of luck. <laughs> we'll need. Yeah. Thanks, Jake. Thank you.